Uh, hi, folks. This is Layman Pascal on the Integral Stages author series, talking with integrative cosmoecologist Sean Kelly about his new book, Becoming Gaia. We'll be exploring the second axial age, the Gaia Anthropocene, the intersection of integral theory and complex systems, and maybe a trans-pessimistic approach to the environment and the emergence of the planetary context. Hi, Sean. Hey, Layman. Good to see you. That's great lead. Before we get into this stuff, why don't you tell people where they can buy this book? Um, well, uh, unfortunately, on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think uh, you might be able to go directly to Revelor Press, uh, but they I'm, I'm not sure whether they'll just redirect you to Amazon or not. But uh, yeah, the, the beast, it's, it's up <laughs> on the beast. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give a tiny weird anecdote and then I'll get into my first question because you use the word guy anthropocene a lot in this book to indicate the, uh, the epoch of human influence at the mass scale of the geosphere and ecosystem and the ways that might dovetail with an awaking to and as the planetary context. But mm. that's led to a weird personal thing for me because I tend to use this free software to turn text into audio so that I can listen while I hike or do yard work. And the artificial voices don't always get the timing and intonation correct. So for the last couple of weeks, I frequently heard a stilted robot voice tell me that we're entering the gay Anthropocene <laughs> epoch. And I'm like, the gay Anthropocene? Is that a thing? <laughs> what does that look like? <laughs> so I just thought I would mention that. And that was fun for me. Yeah, well, it would probably be, uh, I, 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 I'd put my bets that it would be a better regime than the current one. That's for sure. <laughs> you couldn't do much worse. <laughs> so I guess my, my first real question is, um, if we conceive Gaia as a hypersubject, as an interiority beyond or analogous to Morton's notion of hyperobjects, does that mean she has intentions? And if so, what are those intentions? Yeah, what a great question. Well, I mean, I could say far be it from me, you know, a, a, a single human among uh, the you know millions of species that constitute Gaia to speak on behalf of Gaia of what those intentions might be. On the other hand, if we don't, who will sort of thing, you know? So if, if we do, and if I try to, or you try to, then the, the, the best we can do is to, you know, deepen into our felt sense, our intuitive sense, and then bring our, our uh, most developed uh, self-reflexive cognitive capacity to work on these feelings and intuitions and come up with what Plato might say, a likely story, you know, what, what would be a likely story? Uh, and, and, you know, that's the most I, I can do. And there's many possibilities, many likely stories, but one might be that the intention is to wake up to herself in her full potential. And of course, this begs the question, what, what, what is her full potential? Here, I would take my, my clue from what uh, the sages have, you know, the great sages have always told us that the highest potentials are love, compassion, wisdom. And, you know, what might that look like on a planetary scale? I could say, well, it would probably look like justice. Um, and of course, we could say, well, what is justice? But, you know, we, we've come up with um, all kinds of answers to that question. There's international law, there's universal human rights, which is now being expanded to the idea of rights of nature and so on. So we already have many, many coherent, uh, internally consistent and um, widely distributed and resonant narratives and uh, conceptual schemes that could um, guide us into knowing to what extent we are in the process of realizing Gaia's intention. So this would be one, one approach that I would take. Well, Does that make well, sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I know like I'm going to ask questions that don't really have answers. So I just appreciate Good. you trying. <laughs> Those are the best. Those are the best questions. <laughs> um, here's another one. Here we are as human beings and we tend to gather naturally in family and tribal structures and, mm. Over there, the far shore is the emergent uh, Gaian identity. Mm -hmm. What is the natural mediating structure or scale between those? Is it the nation state or is the nation state a corrupted false mediator? Wow. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, the nation state, I'm sure as you know, has played a crucial role in organizing, in the self-organization of the, the planetary community. Uh, unfortunately, through war, you know, mostly through war and conflict, but also through establishing mutual relationships of uh, dependence, mutual dependence, well, domination and mutual dependence through trade and cultural exchange and so on. So, you know, I, I think it would be unrealistic to, as, as much as I am a allergic, as much as I'm allergic to patriotic feelings as normally expressed and, and deeply allergic to most forms of nationalism, I do recognize that it's a, uh, we could say a natural and in some cases healthy form of identity to the extent that uh, it serves or can serve to help liberate individuals and communities from various forms of oppression on the one hand. Uh, it can also give the individual or communities a sense of participation in, in a wider identity that transcends uh, ethnicities, since many nations, not all, but most nations, consist of multiple ethnicities, multiple communities, and so on. So we could see the nation state as a, um, uh, an inevitable, but ultimately to be transcended uh, mediator between ethnicities and a truly planetary form of organization. You know, whether they would be, whether the national identities could ever be, I don't think they, they could or even should be annihilated, but they will need to be, uh, continue to be relativized and uh, uh, modulated, you know, otherwise we'll just destroy ourselves through, through war, obviously. Uh, I've heard that you are a Tai Chi practitioner. Is that correct? I am. Yeah. Has has that practice helped you understand anything about uh, healthy interactive relationships between species, beings, and systems? Hmm. Well, I mean, primarily the practice has just helped me stay sane and, and you know, as, as sane as I can be sure. and uh, a, a, as healthy as I can be because I spend so much time in the frontal cortex and, and uh, you know, uh, yeah. in the head. So the, the Tai Chi helps me daily uh, re-inhabit the, um, the body-mind in, in, its, uh, in its wholeness, even if that only lasts for you know, moments or a few minutes of my hour, hour and a half practice. But um, so in those moments, uh, which is both in the moving practice and in the standing meditation practice, uh, it, it does allow me to experience in a... In a full in a kind of integral way a certain spaciousness where i feel my indissoluble continuity with the wider body body mind and soul of the planet and sometimes even more than the planet so it gives me an experiential embodied taste on a daily practice of being more than you know what's what's called the skin encapsulated ego and and, and confined to this part of my being uh, so it's vital for me, but um, yeah, it's hard to make any direct connection between the, the the experience and the ideas that I work with. Although there is a felt connection there, to be sure. Mm -hmm. There are a number of thinkers that you come back to a lot in your mm -hmm. work, so mm -hmm. I'd like to touch on those guys a little bit mm -hmm. as we go forward. And I'd like to start with Hegel. Yeah, um, you know. Why is he important? What does he mean to you? How does he enter your thinking? And, and also maybe what do you think a lot of people misunderstand about Hegel's work? Mm, yeah. Well, I first encountered Hegel uh, as an undergraduate in the course with my mentor who passed away a couple of years ago, uh, John Dooley, who was a uh, Jungian analyst and a um, kind of heretical Catholic priest in Ottawa, Canada. And um, it was in his course where he pointed to the, the, the deep correspondence between Jung's model of the psyche and Jung's view of the evolution of consciousness and Hegel, because uh, Hegel seems to have been one of the first who clearly articulated the idea that uh, the human project is, part, is a 
focal manifestation of a more universal cosmic evolution of consciousness uh, that can be characterized as a, as a dialectical movement uh, towards greater wholeness. So this was, you know, the, the first insight. I said, wow, I should look into Hegel. And then when I, you know, looked into him, of course, I saw how rich his thinking is, um, both as a training in, in thinking itself, but also in particular in thinking about our moment, because Hegel was the first one, at least philosophically, there were others who, who did it theologically, like Joachim of Fiore about a thousand years ago, uh, or even St. Paul in the New Testament and so on. Others who did it theologically and mythopoeically, but Hegel was the first to do it philosophically to, to articulate the idea that in his time, which in many ways is still our time, but he was at sort of the beginning of the threshold that we're right in the middle of now, that in his time, which is still our time, the human project had, in a sense, come to some kind of end, which um, uh, the the Russian Hegelian expatriate uh, Kozhev in the mid 20th century made more popular with the idea of the end of history. So this was a you know a startling idea that what do you mean the end of history? How how can we be at the end of history? But you know Jung in uh, answer to Job has something similar thought. He doesn't call it the end of history, but um, he invites us to reflect on you know, the biblical mythos that in many ways has guided the evolution of the Western mind, which for better or worse provided the, the, the chrysalis for the emergence of the planetary era that we're in now, that that, that evolution has been guided in some sense or prefigured by the, the, the biblical mythic structure of a movement from creation through uh, a kind of fall uh, incarnation and then this mysterious intuition of an end or apocalypse as it's called in the in the last book of the bible which really means an unveiling or a revelation so um you know this was my formation too as a, i was raised a catholic a, a benign catholic not a fundamentalist catholic or anything like that but those those mythic structures definitely imprinted themselves uh in my deep psyche so here was Hegel who, who brought that mythic structure to a level of philosophical conceptual articulation and then Jung who did it psychologically. So uh, at that point, you know, Hegel became my philosopher just as Jung became my psychologist and they, they, they were woven into my psychic spiritual DNA ever since. Nice. There's a, seems like there's a lot of richness that's possible reading Hegel and Jung together. Yeah, I, I really like the idea that it uh, provides you with a way of taking advantage of some of those background Christian structural concepts that you were saturated in. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, when you asked, you know, what are you had a second part of um, uh, about yeah, Hegel. We don't need to go there, but yeah. I, I want to make sure I don't forget anything. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just was asking whether you what you thought people sort of misunderstand most oh, yeah. about Hegel. Right. That's right. Yeah. Well, I mean, the misunderstanding began, you know, soon after his death, where there were the so-called right-wing Hegelians and the left-wing Hegelians, and and then there was like Feuerbach and Marx who claimed to stand Hegel on his head, and existentialism was born, and phenomenology. So many things came out of Hegel. It's like Hegel created this this um, you know perfect sort of hypersphere, which as soon as it was created, fragmented into into all of these possibilities which all claim to be the truth and uh that continues to this day there are there's there are many strands of uh hegel interpreters so this this is one of the the issues with hegel that he he has an intuition and a what a concept of that intuition which is very very hard to be true to uh since you know, it's an invitation to what, let's say, Ken Wilbur would call a, you know, post-formal form of cognition, which is, uh, or what Morin would call a complex thinking, which is not easy to do. So many people, I think, in looking back at Hegel, uh, first of all, they collapse his his situatedness and, and the specificity of his, of his own historical situatedness, where, for instance, <clears throat> he had some re some not very helpful things to say about, let's say, Africa or 
or uh, the essential nature of women or uh, or the the nature of the Prussian state and so on. And they they think that that is equivalent to this to the core intuition or the concept that he's offering, which which is a mistake, I think. So that's one mistake. The other mistake is to take the core intuition and make it a kind of formula that can be applied externally. So one often hears that Hegel is about thesis antithesis and synthesis, for instance. And that's true. But if you look at Hegel's, whenever he talks about the synthesis, uh, it's always in, it's always utterly paradoxical and and in constant flowing movement. So the synthesis is not a question of of a uh, wrapping up all contradictions and making them disappear. Uh, similarly, his idea of the end, if you want to call it that, the end of philosophy or the end of history, is not necessarily the idea that nothing ha- there's nothing new can happen or that there's no possibility for development. So the the big danger is simplifying the core intuition and the core concept uh, in those two ways, I think. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with a Beastie Boys song, Johnny Royale. No, Uh, tell me about it. I never really listened to that much, but I was peripherally aware of them when I was a kid. And I knew this song had this chorus that goes, Johnny (laughs) Royale. And when I hear Bruno Latour, that's Uh, what I hear in my head. A voice goes, Bruno Latour. (laughs) Um, and I, I'm kind of curious, you touch a bit on it in the book, but where would you say that you agree and disagree with Latour's work? Well, you know, I don't know all of his work, so I can't be completely fair to him. Um, I mean, I've read his Gifford lectures carefully and a few of his essays and and, and some secondary material. I, I mean, I, I, I think he's, you know, he's right on, not particularly original, but right on in terms of the, the social construction of knowledge. And uh, I, so, so that's one thing. Yeah, got that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he has so many moments of, bril- of, of, of brilliance. He's very clever uh, with this idea of the, 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 the earthbound, for instance, or you know that uh, his, his emphasis on the this worldly and the earthly character of our moment, uh, I, I fully with him there. But like so many of his uh, French compatriots, I, I believe who are coming out of this post-structuralist era, who have a an absolute allergy to anything that claims to be speaking of the whole or system. Uh, any type of closure they they want to resist completely, uh, and um, you know, for instance, as you as you read and you already know, I'm sure he he says that Gaia is is not a system, right? Well, uh, why you know why why should we say that Gaia is not a system? What what's the problem with the system? So I I guess. Um, yeah, and he he's, he denigrates also the idea, the traditional idea of, let's say, the anima mundi or the soul of the world. So I, I he's, you know, he says his fam- one of his famous books is we have uh, we've never been modern, right? But I think actually his his insistence on no system, on on radical plurality uh, without any ontological foundation let's say is actually a form of of hyper modernism so he, he's actually hyper modern rather than you know so th- these are the issues i have with him but i i think he you know I, I i honor and respect the the intent of his work and i agree with a lot of it but i also get annoyed just at his language uh, I, I which i find is um is is too clever sometimes self-absorbed and um, not very helpful to me. I, I much prefer, as I say in the book, Edgar Morin, uh, his, his contemporary, slightly older contemporary, actually Morin will be 100, turn 100 uh, in, in August, who I find writes so clearly and thinks so clearly. But that's just me. You know, you can't please everybody. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Do you have, what are your thoughts on, on the, uh, I, I think very similarly, I think there's a, there's an interesting French tradition of 
really trying to avoid totalization and closure and, you know, even anthropocentrism and things like that, but they can be a little too self-absorbed and go a little too far with it. And I think when you talk to them personally, they're not as adamant as they are in their writings, right? Oh. They're, they're trying to fight against something that they see as a problematic framing, but when they're not trying to fight against it, they're actually more open to, you know, functionally it operates as if it was a system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ha ha. Yeah. Yeah. There's a part of integral theory that I think is probably not integrated well enough, which is the Wilbur Combs lattice. Hmm. And I think it's really important to tease apart the maturational levels from the state experiences. And one of the reasons to do that is because traditional models of a big picture hierarchy have tended to put um, mortality, matter, life, women, animals, and plants at the bottom <laughs> and proceed toward increasing disembodied abstraction, the mm. subtle causal non-dual. Right. Um, Nietzsche was a big critic of this. And how do you think the, the second axial age has to reverse that first axial age tendency to be anti-naturalistic in their developmental trajectory? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, the thread that I'm suggesting that's worth pursuing in, uh, in, in this book is to, for those of us who are you know, interested in something like a second axial age, and uh, and if we if we are already in dialogue with the uh, main expressions of the first axial age, whether because we situate ourselves in them or because we're critiquing them, for me the most helpful thing is to is to track the core uh, intuition and commitment of the first axial age, which is to the idea or concept of universality. So, you know, the first axial age uh, in philosophy, whether it's in philosophy with Plato uh, at, at its peak, one might argue, um, or with, you know, Lao Tzu with, with uh, the Tao or uh, the Jewish prophets with their appeal to, to the law and Torah and the, the will and, and in, intent of the creator and so on. These all, to my mind, are uh, expressions speaking cognitively and philosophically of the intuition and concept of the universal. Uh, particularly, initially, in a strongly ethical sense. So there's the there's the idea that um, it's possible to intuit and articulate values which ought to stand for everybody. Normally this is called the good, but you know, we, we try to embody it in our laws and uh, in our social behaviors and individual actions and so on. So there's this intuition of, of the universal, of universality. And of course, that, that's the ethical side. Uh, in terms of, of the true or the cognitive side, this <clears throat> eventually expresses itself, I think, in the, let's say, in the idea of system or, or laws of nature, that it's possible to intuit and to articulate structures or concepts relating to the cosmos, which uh, apply in all situations and for all times under all conditions. It's the idea about law, the universal law. So to me, this is the great emergence of the first axial age is this, this um, concept and intuition of, of the universal, whether in the form of the good or the true. We could talk about the beautiful too, but you know, primarily the, 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 the good and the true. Yeah. So the second axial age, as I see it, is actually um, that we're in now, is actually continuous with the first axial age. It's part of a single, uh, what I call Aeon, a single organic process that I call the axial aeon or ion. Uh, and the question then becomes, you know, what is the universal? Is the universal, as you were saying, uh, do, we, do we try to ground the universal in the idea and concept or image of, of a transcendent beyond a kind of, um, yeah, whether we call this you know, a, a subtle realm or a spirit, 
which we can do. But then the question becomes, what is the relationship of that subtle or causal realm, this transcendent beyond uh, to the here and the now? So uh, this is the great task, I think, of the second axial age, speaking philosophically, is how to rethink, reimagine the universal in a way that is pragmatically, uh, we could say, useful for our moment, uh, but we could also say that it's philosophically coherent. Mm -hmm. And here, of course, I'm, I, I am continue to be inspired by Hegel, who was the first one to really nail down the idea of uh, the concrete universal, uh, which um, uh, he often does in relationship to a sister intuition, which is the intuition of the infinite. Because again, in the first axial age, if we think th theistically, let's say, the universal is identified with, let's say, God, who uh, theologically is described as infinite. So infinite in power, infinite in knowing, infinite in presence, and so on. But the, the imagination, the, the religious imagination tends to picture this God or this uh, infinite as somehow standing not only above but outside of the created order of the universe, we might say. And Hegel was the first one to point out the, the logical contradiction here that if the divine source or the creative ground, the universal, is literally pictured as outside of that which it has given birth to, then uh, there's a boundary between it and us. And that boundary is precisely the definition of what makes something finite. So if that's true, then the infinite is actually finite. We, we finitize that infinite. And Hegel calls that the bad infinite. So the true infinite, in other words, the infinite that is true to its own concept or intuition must actually include or unfold the finite within itself as uh, a necessary essential expression of its own nature. So in other words, you know, th there is no infinite apart from the finite. So the, the universal then must be concrete. And then the question, well, what, what does that mean? Does that mean uh, that there is no universal apart from the universe? Well, maybe, but we, we can at least say that pragmatically um, and phenomenologically in terms of our experience, existentially and uh, ethically, we could say that the universal is at least this world in which we live and have our being, which uh, is this planet. Yeah. So this is my, my proposal for Gaia as a concrete universal in Hegelian terms, which would be uh, a way philosophically of articulating the, uh, the core concept and intuition that is guiding uh, the second axial age. So this, um, this one axial aeon mm. has these sort of two moves. And the first move establishes the universal through the idea of the transcendent, but it gives us that intellectual and emotional and pragmatic power of the universal. And the second step has to undo the, the situating of that in opposition to the manifest life realm. Exactly. And then that brings us to the planetary awakening or self-awakening as the the crucial contemporary emerging moment of that phenomenon. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. It's so um, nice to be understood. <laughs> it's such a gift. <laughs> actually. <laughs> at yeah, least one like... has understood me. I can I can now say at least one has understood me. That's great. <laughs> well I I appreciated that reading the book very much. I would read a section. I'd be like, yeah, I've seen that. I know what he's talking about. <laughs> oh um okay. let's talk a little bit about edgar moran because mm. i mean a lot of folks know him by way of the concept of complex integral realism mm -hmm. but because he's not in the anglo world there's a lot less clarity than there is around wilbur and baskar mm. so how did you get interested in moran and um what is it what does he see that we need to take more seriously mm. Yeah, well, in uh, when I was doing my doctoral studies, uh, we had one required course, which was a doctoral seminar. 
and in it, the professor assigned Morin's uh, main work called Method, uh, which at the time only consisted of uh, the first two volumes, uh, The Nature of Nature and The Life of Life, but soon to be followed by The Knowing of Knowing and um, you know, several other volumes. And when I started reading this, you know, I was already at work on my dissertation on Hegel and Jung. And I started saying, oh my God, this is so Hegelian. And I was just, you know, completely taken by it immediately. And um, my professor had been in touch with Morin. So I asked him if I could, you know, contact him. Uh, and I applied for a grant from the uh, Canadian government. There was a France Canada graduate scholarship. So I, anyway, I, I had ideas for a postdoc that I wanted to do, uh, look at the relation between Hegel and Morin. And um, my dissertation took a little longer than I had anticipated, but I got the grant. So I took a year off my doctoral studies and went to Paris. Um, I, I wrote Morin and I still have the letter, hand, you know, handwritten on, on that thin air, air mail paper from like 1980 six or something like that, where he agreed to supervise my, uh, my studies. And I was, you know, ecstatic. So I went to Paris for a year, met with him several times and um, wrote what became my first publication, which is a, uh, uh, an essay on Hegel and Morin. And then I went back to Canada. You know, we stayed in touch, kept writing. He came out with his book, Terre Patrie, uh, which I immediately thought, well, wow, my God, this is so relevant. English, the English world needs to know about it. So I, I translated it and it became Homeland Earth. You know, we, we stayed in touch and Moray just, his ideas just immediately poured into me as, uh, as a form of, you know, recognition, uh, sort of anamnesis, almost a kind of platonic anamnesis. But also he made such a deep impression on me as a person, uh, as somebody who, um, is so generous and uh, uh, who is so, ha his whole life has been so committed to community, to dialogue um, and um, devotion to, you know, to the great values of fellowship and love and understanding uh, that he became a kind of hero mentor for me. Then, you know, teaching at CIS, I, uh, co-taught a course with my friend Alfonso Montuori on uh, transdisciplinary inquiry. And at the time, Sean Hargens was my uh, first doctoral student, uh, who's now Sean Espion Hargens. And as you know, he was deep, deep into Ken Wilber at the time. But in our course, we, um, I, I introduced Sean to, uh, to Morin's work. Uh, and we looked at Wilbur and Moray and some other people in terms of transdisciplinary thinking. And to his credit, you know, as devoted as he uh, was at the time to Ken's work, Sean recognized the value of uh, Moray. And uh, after he graduated and you know published his dissertation on revised dissertation with Michael Zimmerman on uh, integral ecology, and started developing his idea of the meta integral, you know, we stayed in touch and. Uh, he, uh, I put him in touch. I think I put him in touch with Moray. I'm not sure. But um, in any case, he eventually uh, invited uh, Moray to come to the Meta Integral Conference with uh, Roy. And it was, so it was pretty neat, you know, to, to see those two together. And so at that point, thanks to Sean, uh, Moray got introduced into the, integral conversation along with Roy. And I was so happy to see that, that the, as you've been trying to do to encourage a broadening of the, the integral conversation an honoring of Ken and a, an invitation to, to broaden the field and uh, bring in other voices. So, so that's how that happened. Yeah. I think that's definitely the moment that we're in now, mm. but um, I want to say, I love this story. I mean, getting some money to go to Paris and study with a guy who's a, a real elder and, and oh has things to say that are pertinent to the world situation. What a fantastic adventure. Oh my God. It was, it was, yeah. It's like the Joni Mitchell song. I was a free man in Paris, unfettered and alive. 
<laughs> not, yeah, not totally unfettered, but uh, definitely alive. <laughs> I um, I live in Ontario, so I, oh. I, I'm my ear is picking up on all the Canadian references that are coming yeah. out of his story. That's where in Ontario are you? I'm I'm in Thunder Bay right now. Okay, yeah, yeah, I've oh. been there. I, I grew up in Ottawa. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's weird. I, I kind of want to say it's just down the road. It's like yeah. what I say when I talk about John Verveke or Jordan Peterson. Oh, they're just down the road, but that's like all of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, okay. So Moran is associated with the concept of complexity. Hmm. And I think somewhere in the book, you sort of summarize that as uh, recursion, uncertainty, and, um, dialogical relations something like right. that yeah mm-hmm. um you know is, is that enough is there more we need to understand about complexity and uh i guess mm. what i really want to say is what does complexity thinking bring to the table that people need in order to understand the world like what what are they going to miss if they don't have this complexity lens yeah yeah well if you look at more on complexity um you see that it came out really of his, um, well, I mean, it has deep biographical roots and, and resonances with his acquaintance, deep familiarity with Hegel and Heraclitus and so on. So there are all those roots. But I guess I would say that um, for Morin, for me, the, the idea and intuition of complexity is something that is true to life. Mm. You know, he, where, where the principles of complexity first become fully evident and in a sense transparent and articulated in Moray's work is in his study of the nature of life. So the second volume of method, the life of life. I mean, it's there in the nature of nature already, but um, you know, when it's when we look at living systems, living organization, whether that be a single cell or a complex organism uh, or any system that, that manifests the principles that we first see fully manifested in a single cell or an organism. And that could include a society or an ecosystem, uh, or I would argue Gaia as a whole. We see that to be true to life, to be true to the, the way that living organization actually manifests itself. Uh, We need to recognize and uh, enact these principles of complexity in order to give a coherent and I would say true account of the phenomena themselves. So whether it's how, you know, how a cell self organizes or, or an organism or an ecosystem and so on. And what we see is that uh, whether it's, that the living system is complex uh, in in the sense that there are uh, elements, parts, and holes, levels of organization, the phenotype, let's say, or the individual, the species, the the organism itself and its environment. There there are elements of the system in question which are always in relationship to each other in specific ways that he describes with these principles of complexity, the dialogic, <clears throat> so similar to the Hegelian dialectic, but where uh, not only are opposites complementary, but sort of true to Hegel's dialectic, they're also antagonistic. So there's a dynamic tension in relation. This is the dialogic. Uh, there are processes of mutual generativity, very similar to the Buddhist core Buddhist notion of dependent co-arising where we, where we see that, you know, this arises and that arises, this, this falls, that falls and so on. So where um, elements in relation are both causally related to each other and uh, affected by the other. So this is the idea of, of recursivity. We see this, you know, in, in a very, uh, what, um, existential way on a planetary scale now with uh, with climate chaos in terms of uh, tipping points and feedback loops. So we have all kinds of recursive relations being played out in terms of uh, the global climate. So, you know, the dialogic recursivity, uh, the holographic principle, where we see that um, 
every living whole uh, is constituted by parts. This is Wilbur's whole on idea. But where the part uh, is not only a whole itself, this is the idea of the whole on, so holes that are made of parts which are themselves holes, but as Morin says, the holes are made up of parts which are holes which contain the whole. Mm. Uh, this is the holographic principle. And there are other principles. Those are the three main ones, but he often adds uh, uncertainty. But the key idea, again, going back to somebody like Jung and Hegel and Heraclitus, is that uh, the nature of the real, and specifically of anything that lives, uh, seems to involve the, uh, the relationship between uh, elements that are not only different, but potentially antagonistic to each other. And that they are woven together. And this is complex array, the, root, the root meaning of complexity. So we, we can't be true to life uh, unless we uh, honor its complexity. So this, this is where I think that um, complexity is valuable. And also it's, it's it, well, maybe I've said enough. For now, I don't want to keep on going on that. Sorry. No, that's great. That's a great um, overview and introduction, I think. Okay. You know, one of my obsessions is what I call planetary shamanism. Ah. And so I'm very uh, intrigued. My ears perk up when I read about the, let's say, the meta crisis as an initiatory global scale ordeal. Mm. And so, my, but the shaman doesn't always survive the ordeal, doesn't always work. So I'm curious in your notion of becoming Gaia as an initiatory ordeal, what will it take to survive that, to do that well, to have that be a more graceful rather than a more catastrophic outcome? Like mm. uh, what can we do to skew that in the right direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm asking if humanity is the shaman. Yeah. What does it take for us to be a good shaman and survive this initiation? Mm -hmm. I, I, I love the way you're putting it there, because I think we can learn a lot from uh, looking at these uh, earliest forms of human engagement with this deep psycho-spiritual archetype, we might say, in, in the case of shamanism. So as you know, I mean, in, in the shamanic context, one can't, you know, by all accounts, one can't uh, succeed if one doesn't fully make oneself vulnerable to the threatening feelings, to the 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 threat of suffering and death. For instance, I mean, if we if, if you pull back from too much from the pain, or if you contract in fear too much. I mean, of course, a natural fear response is natural to a certain extent, and a certain amount of contraction is natural. But if, if we run away uh, completely from the fear, from the pain, from the death, then, then the initiation can't take place. So that's, that's one clue. But another clue might be that, um, you know, for traditional forms of shamanism, it seems that the, the initiate or the, the would-be shaman uh, usually can succeed in not fleeing that situation because they have help. And the help, you know, will come in the form of either animal powers, animal allies, uh, or ancestors, help from the ancestors. I mean, it'll, it'll come also from the community, which will often give uh, a space, uh, will give uh, social cultural recognition of the importance of the task. So there, there is help. So the shaman is, is on the one hand doing something radically uh, solitary and alone and needs to face that pain, that death, that initiation on their own, but they can only succeed if they have help. Mm. So, you know, so we might say, well, who, you know, wh where do we go f for help? And especially since, for instance, all of the animals are part of, I mean, it's the whole earth community that's undergoing the initiation. So it's humans, but it's also, you know, hummingbirds and whales and 
the trees and the, the oceans, we're all going through it together. But maybe that means all the more reason to, in a sense, call out for help to, 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 for us speaking as a human, to open my awareness, my heart, mind to the, uh, first of all, to the suffering of the rest of the earth community. But also if we, if we expand our sense of time and participation, we can, we can include the ancestors. We can include the, the soul nature of uh, the other than human beings, uh, which by some accounts have a kind of autonomous, relatively autonomous existence. You know, when we, when we speak of, let's say bear or, or, or wolf, that that soul nature of the animal is not limited to all of the individual bears and wolves. There's something that it, it sort of includes, but also transcends these individuals. So we can tune into and have a relationship to these animal powers still, to the plants and to our ancestors, whether they are our genetic or bloodline ancestors or to our spiritual ancestors, like in my case, Hegel, Jung, or Robindo, uh, but also my family members and the older I get, you know, I have more and more people that, that were once close to me who are now on the other side. And, um, you know, I pray to them. I have an altar with the, the people who have gone before. So all those who have gone before all, all those, if you're open to it, uh, higher beings. So the traditional shamanism, you know, had, recognizes at least the, the, th the three the three realms the upper realm the underworld and this this you know middle earth in which uh, the whole stage is happening so we can appeal to the beings of of the upper realm which for me you know inc includes you know god uh, goddess the mother uh, and um, the the souls of the ancestors and to the the lower realm, which uh, includes all of these deep energies of the living planet, uh, of the plants and the animals and so on. So I think that's what we need to do is to, to call upon consciously and cultivate relationships with our uh, allies, our ancestors and our spirit guides. That's one thing. There's more, but along the shamanic lines, that's what I would suggest. Yeah, that's, that's fabulous. Uh, the, um, I mean, the support of human social context that recognizes this challenge mm. and then this sense of reaching out to allies, whether they be in the other species or in the various lineages or whether they be higher or lower. And then mm. also, like you were saying at the beginning, this emotional understanding where we don't contract from the ordeal. We have to mm. sort of lean into it in a way in order to help it happen more gracefully. Yeah, I mean, as, as um, you, you just reminded me, um, a, a living mentor and, you know, hero and dear friend of, of mine, uh, Joanna Macy, and she has really helped me see uh, how, you know, fear is not the problem. It's, it's, in a sense, fear of fear. So it's all right to be afraid. Uh, but what, what we, it's not to, the, the goal is not to overcome the fear but it's to at least overcome the fear of the fear. So we, 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 can, we want to be able to create space or lean into it, as you say, instead of contracting so much that we just dissociate from the fear, uh, we need to at least be able to, to lean into it enough to open up enough space where the fear can, can stay conscious and not dissociate. And similarly for the grief and the rage and so on. So this, um, yeah. So thank you for helping me remember that. Mm -hmm. In a lot of classical um, models of the cosmos, things are based on physical scale. So mm -hmm. the, the human is bigger than the cell. Humanity is bigger than the human and nature is bigger than humanity. Uh, but Ken Wilber doesn't exactly see it that way because his quadrants allow him to think of the biosphere is the communal dimension of the individual cellular whole on right and so that the then the human social arena is sort of larger and more inclusive than that just as the human individual is larger and more inclusive than the cell 
And that's a very interesting challenge to the normal historical intuition, mm. right? I find myself sometimes having to say things like the trans noospheric biosphere as opposed <laughs> to the biosphere, right? So I'm, I'm curious what your take is on this. Like, what's the difference between the, you know, the flatland web of life that might be less than the community of sapient beings, and the emerging depth ecosystemic web of life that is beyond the limits of the noosphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are, you know, for people like us who have the, you know, the, the what, uh, well, the privilege and the, <laughs> either the aptitude or the curse to be, preoccupied with these kinds of thinking you know it's, it's a it's it's um it's a very fine wine to taste uh but you know i'd say that the biosphere if the biosphere is the sphere of life then you know i think we can say with confidence that at least on this earth the sphere of life has produced human beings who uh, have the capacity to reflect upon and articulate the notion of the sphere of life. So this noospheric, and if we think of it as a planetary, on a planetary scale with the noosphere now, the noosphere is, we could say, an emergent property, or we could say an intrinsic expression mm. of life on this planet. So in that sense, life on this planet, if that's what the biosphere is, the biosphere uh, includes the noosphere, right? Just like we could say water includes wetness. I mean, the we could say, we might say, no, no, water is just H2O. Well, okay, if you want to think abstractly in terms of, of, uh, of um, modern chemistry, which uh, is only going to look at water from an experimental point of view where we separate so-called primary qualities from secondary qualities, et cetera, et cetera. Then yes, water is just H2O. But in my world, you know, water is wet. <laughs> <laughs> so similarly, uh, life uh, uh, on this planet, life uh, feels, thinks, reflects, uh, and um, manifests what we call consciousness. So, have, so, so this is the way I think of it. Um, you know, I, I can take a more idealist perspective and say that, well, but life is is really a concept, is a is a structure of consciousness that is dependent upon you know, social conventions, upon uh, linguistic structures and so on, that, you know, there, that life is, is really an expression of, of thought. And that's true enough. So again, in, in Morinian terms, the, the, the truth seems to be a complex weaving together of, we could say a more naturalist, perspective that sees uh, consciousness, the noosphere as an emergent property of, of matter and life itself on one hand, and a more idealist perspective, which sees matter and life <clears throat> as uh, expressions of consciousness or spirit. And they, they both seem to be true in their own logics in their own, in, in the deep logic of their own intuitions, they are both true and they're both antagonistic. So here again, we have, we have an example of, uh, of a dialogical relationship between a more naturalistic and a more idealist discourse or narrative of explanation of the relationship between what we're going to call life and consciousness or the biosphere and the noosphere. So I, you know, I think it all depends on on the concrete situation, which one we want to make, or the pragmatic consequences of any particular situation, which one we want to give priority to. But from a philosophical point of view, I would say the more coherent perspective 
is one that that allows the the dialogical tension to persist, and and we won't you know we won't necessarily come down on one or the other. Although we may for certain in certain situations, like for instance, when I consider who I am, you know, who is Sean. Maybe I'm just deluding myself and wishful thinking, but my 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 authentic belief and intuition is that I am somehow not just and I am more than this body. So there's a sense in which who I am includes the body, but the body, it includes the body in a way that the body doesn't include uh, who I feel I am. Even though, you know, who I am in this life and in this particular incarnation is associated with the history of this body and, and would not be able to manifest without the history of this body. Who I am is, is somehow more, we call this a soul, traditionally call it a soul. And, and I believe that because I feel it and I, and I want to believe it for you and for my beloved and so on that when she, when she dies, that's not the end uh, of her. There's something more to her than just her body. So that's the truth of the idealist or the, the spiritual point of view. And I believe it, it's true. And so, so my, my task uh, intellectually and ethically, pragmatically, is to somehow hold these two together and create a, these two orientations together and create a tension. Uh, and um, it's hard to do, but um, it's, uh, yeah, and, and, and it, may, it, it may fall apart at certain points, but that's the best I can do. Sure. Mm, this <laughs> this might be a bit messy. I feel like there's a question in here somewhere among a, like a whole bunch of things that are woven together in my mind. Yeah. A little while ago, I was asked to write an article on hope for Revision Magazine. Oh. Right? And so I, I partly I started laying out what a world worth hoping for is and how the human and the natural have to come together. But more and more as I wrote it, I started thinking about voluntary hopefulness. And it's partly because I have a background in Buddhist psychology and the practice of trying to intentionally select emotional states. Mm. But also I became more and more aware of how passive we are in terms of looking at the world and looking at the news and saying, well, do the facts allow me to feel good or feel bad? Will someone give me a story where I can be inspired or, or will they not give me that story? And I began to feel really worried about that passivity. And it reminded me of Nietzsche, who I think is probably an underappreciated proto integralist in a lot of respects. And he was really interested in the tragic character of the pre-Socratic Greeks and, and also in the hidden nihilistic character of the great idealistic religions. And it seems to me that what he was saying is if you're healthy, then you take constructive action, even if there's no point and there's no justification. But on the other hand, if you're not healthy, then even the action you take is kind of pointless and regressive, even if you have an inspiring narrative. Mm -hmm. So, And I, I sort of see a bit of that tension in this book where mm. you're, you're presenting on this one hand, these trends that might be optimistic and new ways of viewing things, but also taking really seriously the possibility that everything ends, that it could completely fail, but that nonetheless, we still have to take healthy, constructive action, even or even because it's pointless. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Uh, I, I didn't mention Nietzsche in, in the book, but um, I did refer readers at a certain point to uh, my very dense, admittedly dense uh, uh, monograph on time, on uh, integral time, where I do engage Nietzsche a little bit. Uh, and he has certainly been uh, an influence on me with, as I hear you speaking of him, um, with his uh, ideal of amor fati or the, uh, the love of fate, which for him seems to have been tied to this, I would say a mystical intuition, uh, the uh, repeated experience that he must have had that he articulated in terms of eternal recurrence, which he also called the greatest weight, right? the greatest ethical weight. So if we, if, if we imagine as he seems to have done, not seems to, he did imagine explicitly. If we imagine as he did, that the infinity of the cosmos is such that everything that has ever happened 
has happened an infinite number of times. Everything that will happen has already happened an infinite number of times in this sort of fractally proliferating uh, multiverse uh, of the eternal return, right? What would you do if that's true? And he seems to have believed that it's true. Well, one option is just, oh my God, you know, and just roll over and, <laughs> and die. But then you realize, oh my God, this moment of rolling over and die, dying has not only happened an infinite number of times in the past, but will happen an infinite number of times in the future. So what if I don't roll over and die, even though no matter what I think is coming, then that response, as you're saying it, which is not just the passive response, but an, an active embracing of our finitude of this moment, of this opportunity, that active response to is something that we can look forward to, to infinity, uh, as as held in in this this uh, uh, multiversic embrace of the eternal return, right? So that so on the one hand, there's the greatest weight of thinking, oh my God, but on the other hand, there's a possibility of of a true ecstasy, of uh, you know of of um, a joyful wisdom, as he called it. Freudische Wissenschaft, just uh, that um, can provide us with um, inspiration, with energy, with uh, commitment, and um, yeah, even even ground our love. You know, so yeah, Nietzsche is normally thought of as not a very loving person, but actually, I see, I think, as you do too, his his view as um, helping us, helping us love. So. Um, yeah, so in terms of hope, similarly, if what I do in a minute from now, if, if what I choose to do, if what I do is, is somehow held in the, the, the embrace of, of the infinite as an ever-living present, whether we or if we think of it as an eternally recurring present, I, I think of it as an ever-living present then it matters infinitely what we do, including the attitude we bring, but every little action, it sort of matters infinitely, even if the story ends tomorrow, because you know the time between now and tomorrow is held in infinity. Uh, so you know, if we think of it in terms of a scale, you know, how are we going to weigh the relative ethical weight of, let's say, my previous 64 years of relative unconsciousness that might end, you know, two hours from now? But what if in the next hour I suddenly wake up and get to do something that is truly loving, that is truly open to the great mystery? Which, which scale on the scale of Osiris, you know, which side of the scale is, is going to be heavier? You know, the, the 64 years of unconsciousness or this, this one moment of awakening? Well, I like to think that, you know, the life that, that I'm mixing metaphors here, but, <laughs> but if, if I was to, to be in front of Osiris and being judged, I think I, I would be saved if I had that one moment, you know, even if it was my last moment, and uh, as I know, you know as well that you know the Tibetan tradition, the Buddhist tradition, the Tibetan Book of the Dead reminds us that that at the moment of death we have this opportunity to to wake up, uh, even if the whole sequence of the previous life or previous lives have been more or less mired in the three poisons of ignorance, greed, and hatred. There is the possibility now, at every moment, to wake up, uh, and if that happens then perhaps to return to your, your initial, uh, you know, so, so important question, what is the intention of Gaia? And, and if, if, you know, if the intention in a sense is to wake up, then, um, you know, maybe it's enough. Like, even if it all just unravels, you know, I hope it doesn't, and I'm going to do everything I can in my limited capacity to to um, slow it down or stop it. But even if it does, you know, maybe it's enough if 
one of us or enough of us wake up in time to to truly love one another this is so um um well it's emotionally very alive for me this part of it and i i, I see it as sort of the core of the the end of the book mm-hmm. and i'd like to uh dig into it a little more i'm going to ask it again and like i'm going to fractally reiterate the question in a slightly different form which is maybe a little more personal because uh, we've got kids in the house right and they watch a few documentaries about the state of the ocean and they're walking around talking like they've only got 25 years left mm-hmm. and part of me wants to correct them with some palliative optimism and say that things are going to be fine. But I also don't want to do that because, you know, I want them to appreciate the scale of the situation and the fact that it might not work and that ultimately everything ends, but that somehow apart from that, they have to have a strategy for living a meaningful life. And, you know, what's, you know, what's your advice? What do you say to young people who aren't necessarily convinced by the the boomer notion that it will all work out that maybe still dominated in the eighties and nineties. And now people are not as convinced, even though it still could, Hmm. but what do you say to a young person today who doesn't necessarily feel like there's confidence about the future? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I bow to you with your, uh, in your, uh, there's such uh, important, precious role as a as a parent. Um, I don't have kids, so I don't have to 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 deal with it you know, existentially in the way that you do. So it's maybe easier for me to say you no. Know. But uh, I guess um, in my interactions, not only with young kids but with adults who uh, also, you know, I have to make a decision how to communicate these things with, with, with adults in many situations, whether it's family members, people I love, or even people I don't know, but who you can see are, are really don't really don't get or are not letting themselves, not yeah. letting in the, the, the true extremity of our situation. You know, do we be like Nietzsche's madman and you know, run down the streets, you know, God is dead sort of thing. Well, I I, um, I try to be guided by the you know, the Buddhist ideal of compassion and skillful means. So I try to feel into where the person is at and what they're able to grasp cognitively, and get a sense of how ready they might be emotionally to deal with such cognitions. And if I if I sense that it would just not be helpful because one, they're, they're not quite there cognitively yet, or they don't have the emotional support to deal with it. Then I don't speak about it uh, unless they approach me and they want to, then I can see that there's something wanting to happen there. But again, I'll try to gauge where they're at and um, uh, I'll stress certain things depending upon the situation. And, and one thing I'll always bring up which is true, of course, is radical uncertainty. Mm-hmm. The fact is we, we just don't know. But for adults who I feel do have the cognitive capacity and I feel are being uh, just not rising to their own ethical potential, I will resist them using uncertainty as a, uh, an escape route for dealing with the emotions. Because I, I, you know, I encounter many people say, oh, you know, there's radical uncertainty, everything's uncertain. Yeah, except your death you know, and, and the eventual death of the sun and the plant. These are you know, as certain as things can be. So, but there is radical uncertainty. We don't, we don't know for sure. Of course, we don't know for sure whether civilization will collapse, whether the mass extinction will continue uh, and, and, you know, to its dire conclusion. We don't know that. Uh, and we also don't know the timing and the rate. So there's always the, as, as Morin loves to say, toujours l'imprévisible, always the unforeseeable. That is something that um, uh, we need to accept. If we look at the, the, cos- the cosmological record, nobody could have predicted the emergence of flowers. Nobody could have predicted every evolutionary jump. If scientists had been around right before, uh, they couldn't have predicted its emergence. 
Similarly for the historical record, if you look at the great you know, turning points in history, you know, outbreak of the First World War, the defeat of the Nazis, you know, Napoleon's, nobody could have predicted these things. So there's that. And, uh, you know, so for kids though, I guess I would, uh, if they're already watching it and they're, they're approaching it, I would, first of all, just honor them. Yeah. The, you know, uh, you know, how do you feel about this? And, and whatever they feel, I would just mirror that and show that you you're with them in that feeling. And then, then what, I guess it would depend on the situation, how far they're wanting to go might bring in, well, of course, we don't know what's going, what's going to happen. The uncertainty card. And then um, find ways to actually, you know, the, the best thing would be to find ways and strengthen the ways in which they feel connected to something more than their own vulnerable little bodies and their sense of, um, you know, family connections are important, of course, but if they're feeling that the family is threatened, and you know, if they're fe- if they're getting messages that the whole world is being threatened, still, if to the extent that they can have more and more experiences of feeling connected to the soil, to the plants, to the sky, to others in the community, there'll be much greater emotional resilience uh, to deal with these feelings. Because the feelings will keep coming, but you know, if we've been trained and only have experience of being nothing but this little vulnerable body that lives in an isolated community that never has any contact with the greater body of Gaia, it's going to be really hard to take in these emotions uh, versus if we have more and more experiences of feeling our identity as being continuous with this larger body. And that'll actually be the optimal conditions for the individual being able to act on behalf of this larger body. And if there is a chance to avoid the worst, to do that. The, I love that. Uh, you know, the, the sense that you have to have enough connectedness to, uh, to be able to hold the uncertainty. Mm. And, um, you know, behind all of that, there, there's something about, you know, appreciating that uncertainty and in a Hegelian way, you know, and this really came across to me and I was on my hands and knees listening to your book and weeding the garden the other day. Oh. I thought, you know, the end times is a kind of mindfulness, right? Like being aware that we're in, in the end zone, whatever that means. We don't know the outcome, but this is an eschatological moment. And remembering that is a kind of, it's a special mindfulness. It's a way of being aware and being present that maybe some of our ancestors had, but it seems like we all need to be able to dip into that now. Mm, mm, definitely. And it, it's an exhilarating time for, you know, for if nothing else, gee, you know, um, great occasion to feel the most alive that we can feel to the extent that we open ourselves to, uh, to this threat. So it's paradoxical. It's an end time, but it's, it's a time of, there are things that are ending and there are things that need to end, you know, um, the rule of capital, empire, patriarchy, these things need to end. So to the extent that we can, we can hospice these structures yeah. uh, uh, out of existence, then uh, we're making space for something new to, to emerge, whatever that would be and will be in for how, however long it might last. The, the need to open that intrigues me. I think there's, you know, somewhere in Heidegger, he talks about when we, as soon as we see the peril of the world, then we're open to care for the world, which is mm. a, like a new thing. In a way, it's the world caring for itself coming forth through us, mm. but it, it doesn't happen to everyone just because they hear about the peril of the world. We also have to uh, open ourselves in some way to gracefully expose ourselves to that peril, to let it turn over into care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this is, you know, what I heard you in, in your uh, conversation with Bruce and uh, um, Rebel Wisdom saying it's not enough to just say the words, you know, uh, as important as that might be. Uh, we, you know, we need to open ourselves 
to to make a choice to be vulnerable enough uh, to feel certain things, uh, to take uh, the risks of doing certain things, uh, knowing that we'll we'll fail, that we'll fall short, but you know otherwise, yeah. I mean that's where, that's where the hope lies. If there is any any hope, it's in it's in the risk taking of of uh, allowing ourselves to feel certain things by ourselves and together and to be honest with ourselves about these feelings. Mm -hmm. I know it's not the focus of this book and and you've worked on it elsewhere, but the notion of time kind of creeps into the edges of all your thinking here, whether it's Nietzsche's eternal recurrence, or you spend a little bit on uh, Dogen's notion of the time being. Uh, I, I think different, different worldview experiences of time are fascinating. You know, and if I take Ken Wilber seriously, then I'm like, oh, well, maybe there was, you know, when people say God created the world 6,000 years ago, you know, well, that's really interesting. That's what you feel is a visceral amount of real time. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's a series of apocalyptic sequences of 6,000 years. And then Darwin comes forward and, and there's a small group of people who go, you know what? A couple billion years feels real to me. Right. And then there's some other people who say, well, maybe it's endless, multiple, simultaneous sequences of branching quantum time. I can (laughs) kind of feel that. Yeah. (laughs) So there's these different, you know, uh, complexity levels of time. And I'm I'm curious what your fascination with time is and, and what you mean when you talk about integral time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you know, personally, I, I, I've had, certain experiences. I mean, the, the earliest one that I can remember, I was in nursery school. So somewhere between the age of one and a half and five, cause that's it was nursery school. But I remember just sitting in this little sandbox and um, uh, I couldn't articulate it to myself at the time, of course, but I had the, the, just the experience of, of sort of, ah, here I am. It was a kind of, Mm. just a moment of, of lucidity of, of, and of presence, which later on I could identify as a, um, an experience of, uh, of a certain kind of time or timelessness, time freedom, but which is also a kind of spaciousness. And, you know, th- throughout my life on various occasions, sometimes spontaneously, sometimes through focused, extended contemplation, uh, I have had the, you know, the intuition and then, and then the experience of the paradoxical qualities of time. You know, on the one hand, I, you know, can't deny its passage, uh, and as I get older, of course, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm struck and often not terrified, but with a certain anxiety struck by the, the experience of the acceleration of time. My wife and I like to joke that, that um, every day is garbage day. Like today is garbage day. We have to take out the garbage. And every time it's time to take out the garbage, it's clear. Surely it was just yesterday that I took out the garbage, right? And it's not that I hate taking out the garbage that much, but it's just the sense that the, the weeks are just like, so it's, it's a familiar phenomenon that as we age time, the sense of time tends to accelerate. Now, if you take that curve of time acceleration to its logical conclusion, and if we, if we correlate that also with reports of near death experience, what happens is that the 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 rate the experience of the rate of time accelerates to the point where it, where it approximates what we might call the singularity where all moments are present and this is what many people have reported in terms of near death experiences it's it's uh, uh, echoed in, in tibetan book of the dead uh, and it's what you know many people have experienced in certain non ordinary states of consciousness uh, whether through psychedelics, you know, plant medicines, and so on, there there are states of consciousness where uh, one can have the experience of the entirety of one's past as being present. The future is a little different. I mean, there's some people like Sri Aurobindo and others who ha- seem to have had experiences of the future as present as well. 
but certainly at least the past, there are all kinds of evidence that suggests that what we normally think of the past is better thought of as actually a certain, just a different kind of present. So there are these experiences of time, uh, which I've had and that, you know, personally and that many traditions speak of that help me live with the possibility that this timeline that, that we think of as the human experience on this planet, as well as my own personal timeline that, you know, began 64 years ago and will have a definite end is somehow held within a more uh, spacious presence, present and presence. This helps me because, um, you know, for one, the, all of the things that I love, all the people that I love who have already died and who will die, I can, if I, if I remember and cultivate this experience of the presence of the past, and of a, of, a, of a more integral space where, where moments are uh, present in a higher dimensional awareness, then I, I can relax a little more uh, with the prospect of uh, the death of, my, of everything that I love, including this planet. It doesn't mean that I love it any less or that I won't try to protect my beloved from harm or you know this planet from harm but i can relax a little bit more at least into uh uh the the intuition and uh, the conviction that what i love uh is somehow eternal and um and again with nietzsche and therefore worth worth fighting for because all of these not only the essence of the beloved but in a sense every moment of, of the life of the beloved and of what we love is somehow held and is there eternally. So that will include, um, unfortunately, you know, my failings all the times that I've fallen short, that I've been, that I've been mean or even violent. Those two are in a sense held eternally as are those moments where I forgive the other and myself, where I embrace the beloved, that first kiss. I mean, the, all of the moments of ecstasy and love, those two are there forever. So then it just comes a question again, which scale is heavier, you know, in, in one's individual life or in the life of our species or in the life of this planet or the life of the cosmos. These are theological questions of the nature of good and evil, but. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful resonance. Um, mm -hmm. I guess we're getting near the end now, but I'd like to ask a little something about the social regimes that we live in. Um, you know, I think you mentioned the word hospice in regard to some of the economic situations, you know, patriarchy and capitalism and things like that. And that's a very interesting idea of trying to give them a nice death. <laughs> but people have different takes on that, right? Like yeah. um, some people want to make sure that we say, look, modernity has given us a lot of gifts right it's caused some problems and we have to go beyond it but something of its nature will always be with us and we have to really honor that because it has also fixed a lot of old problems but then we also look at that and go well it's like there's a, a an errant metaphysical logic inherent in the modern approach <laughs> that has to really be overcome or released or something like that, or it's going to keep giving us the results that it keeps giving us, which are short-term benefit at the expense of accumulating multiple crises. So, mm -hmm. you know, what's your take on modern civilization, modern economics, modern sociology, where do we need to get to and how can we release and let go of what we need to release and let go of? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like uh, Ken's distinction between the dignity and the disaster of modernity. I think that's very helpful. Um, we could speak in Jungian terms of the light and the shadow. Uh, we could bring this back to our discussion about the uh, the universal, the ideal of the universal with the first axial age and, and its shortcomings in, in how it's actually been panned out. So I guess what I'd want to retain of the modern uh, is its continuity with this first axial commitment to the universal. 
uh, in the form of universal rights, in the form of, of the rule of rule of law, but not in a Trumpian sense. I mean, true of uh, you know these universal ideals of of liberty, egal, uh, uh, equality, fraternity, in, in in the French formulation, this trinity of of ideals. These to me are 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 you know liberty, equality, fraternity are are to me like really high up there with the true, the good, and the beautiful. And it's it's what it's one example of what modernity birthed that I think needs to be uh, honored, and and that we need to continue to uh, be committed to. And I can grant that capitalism and even patriarchy, you know, there would there would be no planetary civilization without patriarchy and capitalism. So I, I'm prepared to bow to patriarchy and capitalism for their role in bringing about the planetary era and creating the conditions for the possibility, at least, of a truly Gaian consciousness. Having done that, however, you know, as you say, we see that they are, they are now, uh, you know, more toxic than not, at least in the way that they are manifesting themselves. I mean, if patriarchy is the rule of the fathers, and if it's defined as a, as a dominator hierarchy, to speak in, in Ken's terms, then to me, there's just no question that's got to go. You know, the, 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 there, there is no room for dominator hierarchies. I, I, I do believe there is room and necessity for, for healthy hierarchy, if only in pragmatic situations where somebody's got to decide. There's got to be a, there's got to be a, uh, there's got to be a structure to any to any living system. And and a, you know, if it's only lateral and flat, nothing can get done. We saw this in the Occupy movement. So. You know, Morin likes to speak of actually a, a complex bricolage between hierarchy, heterarchy, and anarchy. Uh, all three need to be in a, if we look at a healthy ecosystem, we see that it works precisely because there are moments when hierarchy is needed. Uh, so take even a, um, a slime mold, you know, slime mold lives in the state of most of its life in a state of sort of radical heterarchy. But then at a certain point, when it's, the food runs out, the mold becomes an organism with a head that can move and, and uh, to a new place. And, and so it becomes extremely uh, vertically organized and hierarchical for pragmatic reasons. So anything living to adapt needs hierarchy. But you know, we also need heterarchy, and we need enough anarchy uh, to to allow for adaptation as well. So I think we just need to you know be clear on our commitments that certain things are just not okay and need to go. Like um, uh, you know, very, any form of oppression. I think there's a there's a commitment to that 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 we need to make that has been made in terms of international law, in terms of the ideals of liberty, equality, fraternity, and so on. Oppression's got to go. So it's up to us to, to identify oppression uh, and, um, you know, be, have, come to an agreement on what is oppression. And once we agree on that, uh, do everything we can to eliminate it. And, and uh, that to me would involve the dismantling of patriarchy as it has, uh, always been. And capitalism is, is maybe a more complex question. But um, I would say that just pragmatically speaking, I think ethically as well, but um, if capitalism necessarily involves, as I believe it does, private ownership of the commons uh, and a commitment uh, to uh, um, maximization of profit, you know, these two things we know are killing the biosphere. Uh, you know, they're all, they're doing all sorts of other bad things as well. Yes, they have done some good things and we might, you know, uh, we might not be able to get rid of it pragmatically speaking completely, but I think unless we recognize that, that these two commitments uh, or genetic sort of codes of capitalism are in fact uh, have led to and are generating a mass extinction of species and threatening the collapse of civilization, then uh, we won't be able to stop those two things. So if we do want to stop them, it seems that we will eventually, you know, we will have to at least radically curb 
uh, if not uproot, private ownership of the commons and maximization of profit as the, the two leading uh, motives for the organization of the political economy. And we have a choice. We, we either do that, or it seems to me uh, we're heading for inevitable collapse and um, mass extinction. So that's the choice we're faced with. Thank you. This has been really nice getting to know you, Sean. <laughs> Likewise, and, uh, Lyman. I, I, I really enjoyed the book. There's a lot in it. And um, I, I'm not the only one, I'm sure, but I want to really let you know how much I appreciate your work and how much um, spiritual, ethical, and intellectual nuance and human depth I think you're bringing to all of these things. So you know, thanks for all your efforts. Well, thank you, Layman. You know, one never knows whether one is received and I, I feel that from you. Thank you for my, and thank you for all the great work that you've been doing. And I look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Mm -hmm.